Um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'm going to do something very unusual for a speaker at a political meeting. I'm going, to, I'm going to get straight to the point. The British people have been dishonestly led into the United States of Europe. And now is a huge opportunity for the British people to finally have their say. Because not since 1975, like anybody under the age of 57, I haven't had the opportunity to vote on a simple question of Britain's in-out membership of the European Union. And this is an opportunity that generations have been waiting for, and it is, I believe, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity which must not be squandered. And what we have to do is ask ourselves very simply, what is the question? The question is, what direction is Britain going to take? Because I believe if the British people vote to stay, to remain in the European Union, the full federal process of integration will continue. Because I sit with Jill and Bill, Bill the, the other two UKIP MEPs alongside myself in the European Parliament, and we hear on a weekly basis what their plans are. And I have to agree with the late Roy Jenkins, former President of the SDP, former leader of the European Commission. He was a president of the European Commission, being the first, first Brit to actually hold that post. And he said there are only two clear and consistent positions now with regards to Britain's membership of the Union, and that is all in or all out. And we cannot pick and choose the European Union or renegotiate, as the Prime Minister indicates, and it's, you know, we, we've seen what, what's, what's happening with regards to renegotiation, but we cannot mould the European model to suit our liking or indeed any of the other member states. Because this isn't about a German-dominated Europe, it isn't about a French-dominated Europe, and it certainly isn't about a Greek-dominated Europe, but what it is about is forming a new superpower. A superpower that seeks to challenge the United States, that seeks to challenge China and seeks to challenge the emerging markets, India, which is projected by fifth, not 2050 to be the largest economy in the world. Now, it's my belief that the great strength of the continent of Europe is its diversity. The fact that we are all so very, very different. You know, when you go out for a meal, you might say, oh, I went out for a lovely meal last night. What did you have? I had a Chinese. I had an Indian. You never say, I went out, oh, I had a European. <laughs> Doesn't exist, does it? So, I might, have gone out, I might have gone out for a tapas, or I might have gone out for an Italian. I might have gone out for a pizza. But there's no such thing as European. And the great strength of Europe is its diversity. And I believe that the best people to manage Germany are the German people. I believe the best people to manage France are the French people. And I certainly believe that the best people to manage the United Kingdom are the British people. And what I don't believe is that we have an unelected European Commission which runs roughshod over a thousand years proud democracy as a self-governing nation at the whim of this failed political project. Because if you look at it in the terms of running a limited company, we've been a member of this club now for over 42 years. And if you look at the books, if you look at the figures, the business case does not speak for itself. And if you ran a limited company in such a way, you would have to make the decision as to whether voluntary wind it up or face insolvency. And of course you certainly would if you use the medium of the European Union. Because of course they haven't signed off their accounts, they haven't been properly audited for the last 19 years. Now if a director of a limited company ran that company in such a way, not only would the company be struck off, but he would be up in court, facing the wrath of the courts for not fulfilling his legal obligations. But of course, the European Union, it's one rule for one and one rule for the others. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Well, I believe this is a huge opportunity and it's an issue that transcends a traditional party politics. It's not a right-wing issue and it's not a left-wing issue. It is a, the issue that transcends traditional party politics. 
And you only need to look back to 1975, when you had Enoch Powell on the far right of British politics, campaigning with Tony Benn and Barbara Castle and Michael Foote on the far left of British politics. But they all believed in that old-fashioned word, sovereignty. The ability to have a sovereign parliament. And that, ladies and gentlemen, to me, is the great strength of British accountability. And that is the crux of what the question will be when we have this referendum, is are we going to return power to the people? And it strikes me that not only the sacrifices made in two world wars, but also the social sacrifices that were made over the years to let people from all classes and all sexes gain the vote. We look back to Emily Davidson, who died under the King's horse in the 1913 Epsom Derby, one of the suffragettes. If we look back to the Toll Puddle Martyrs, if we look back to the Jarrow March, these are the things that have made Britain a diverse society, which more often than not, after a period of time, we see a fluctuation in how the British people vote in a general election. And that is the great strength. But of course, that ability to have flexibility does not apply with regards to European legislation. Once a European law is in place, it is almost impossible to change that law. And that's why this referendum is so important. We didn't like, as a nation, what John Major had done. So in the 1997 general election, we voted him out of office. We didn't like, as a nation, what Gordon Brown had, and Tony Blair before him had done in 2010. So again, the British people voted him out of office as they turned their back on Mr Clegg in last year's general election. You know, one half of the coalition government. And that really is power. The ability to decide on a parliament who can pass laws that can actually legislate again over poor legislation. And that is what it's all about. It's about flexibility. The world is a far smaller place. When we joined the common market on the 1st of January 1973, we had to look at the national perspective at the time. Decaying infrastructures, a strike-torn nation, over, over powerful union barons <coughs> that were holding the country to ransom just before the winter of discontent. And we looked across the channel and we saw a land of milk and honey. But instead of milk and honey, we got regulation, regulation, and even more regulation. And as I said, the world is a far smaller place now. And if we are to adapt and if we are to be successful, we must have that flexibility. Because flexibility is a key, not just to survival, but actually the key to expansion and future success. And of course we don't have that as members of the European Union because we are tied by this burden of regulation which ties up our small and, small and medium enterprises. You'll hear during the referendum campaign the big businesses, the CBI, the, you know, the big people, the big corporations who will say how important it is that Britain remains a member of the European Union. But 75% of, of the companies in our country are small and medium enterprises. You know, they trade solely within the United Kingdom. And they are the people who are being burdened by this regulation. And I believe that outside the European Union, we can generally have a bonfire of these regulations and not only return our nation to real prosperity, but actually give our youngsters a chance we can rejuvenate our industries because we will be in a situation where it will be far more attractive not only to invest within the country but actually to invest in our youngsters and believe that we can offer them bright future careers. We cannot, ladies and gentlemen, I believe, be allowed to carry on. And certainly with regards to foreign policy, we cannot be allowed to carry on because I sit as an MEP on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. And the plans are now afoot for not only a common foreign and defence policy, but a common security and foreign policy. So we have a situation where NATO is being constrained now. And the European Union are looking for the opportunity, as laid out in the Lisbon Treaty, are looking for the opportunity to expand 
their foreign policy influences. They're dying for, they're dying for the opportunity. We already have a European gendarmerie. We have a Eurocorps. One of the first things I did when I was elected as an MEP, Nigel said, you must come along and watch this. You won't believe it. And it was the official raising of the EU flag on a long line of flags outside the European Parliament in Strasbourg at the very first planning recession. And they were all there, very proud, ode to joy, that lovely Beethoven song that I used to love before it became the European Union National Anthem. That was, that was played. And the Eurocorps marched in, and there were 12 of them marching along like that. And it was bizarre. I, I, mean, I, was, I, I, was, I was never a regular, I was only a, a reservist. I served in the reserves. But I heard a very unusual military command as a flag party. Flag party, the sergeant major said. As I walked, he said, right, left, turn. That's what I had to face him on. I don't know how that would have gone down on, the, on a parade ground at Limston. But the whole thing was a farce. But what was interesting was Elmer Brock, who's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, a very pro-European member of the European Parliament, Angela Merkel's right-hand man in the European Parliament, said to Nigel, well, what did you think of that? And Nigel said to him, tell me, Omar, would you get away with doing that in Germany, marching around with a German flag, goose-stepping? And he said, no, certainly not. So he said, well, why is it good enough for the European Union and not for the German people? And this is a situation, ladies and gentlemen, we have to face. This is about creating a new superpower. But it's also a very positive message. It's about a positive future. It's about our ability to fulfill our real potential as the genuine global trading nation, the country that gave independence to over half the world, a country with influence that so many nations would love to have, a country that won't be isolated outside the European Union, not least because of the IMF, not least because of the G8, and certainly not least because of our seats on this permanent seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. But of course there is another option as well. There is a proud organisation, an organisation, ladies and gentlemen, which is far more geographically, socially and racially diverse than the European Union could ever hope to be. And that organisation, ladies and gentlemen, has something in common with the United Kingdom. It has a proud history. We fought and died together over two bloody world wars. Our blood was mixed together in the soils of France and Gallipoli and across the globe. It's an organisation that may, now makes up 25% of the world's population and 15% of the world's wealth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Commonwealth. And as my party's Commonwealth spokesman, I think it's an absolute disgrace how we turn our back on the Commonwealth back in 1973 when we joined the common market, as it then was. And of course, it was a common market we voted for. We didn't vote for a European Union. We believed it was all about free trade. We believed it was all about cheap wine. But by re-engaging with the Commonwealth and indeed the emerging markets, we had a huge opportunity to really help some of the poorer countries in the globe. Because of EU tariffs, import tariffs on agricultural products produced in some of those Commonwealth countries, we're not even making it easier. We're not making it easy for them to trade their way out of poverty and give some pride. It's about trade, it's not just about aid. It's about giving those people the ability to believe in their countries. And we can't do that whilst the European Union have their fishing boats sucking the, sucking the very life out of the coasts of West Africa and East Africa because they've destroyed their own fishing grounds around the European Union. 80% of which were, of course, within the old 200 mile British territorial limit. So it's about real ability to see our way forward. It's about engaging with the emerging markets, the Vietnams, the Brazils. These are the countries that are dynamic because they're free of this regulation. They're keen to get on. It's about the Commonwealth. We have Canada, we have Australia, we have India. As I said before, by 2050, projected to be the largest economy in the world. We have African nations crying out for the opportunity. And it makes sense. So many British citizens, second, third generation, descendants of Commonwealth 
citizens who came to settle in this country. Surely we can use those family links and use those trading links in a time where the world has become so much smaller. I do business in a press of a button with countries on the other side of the world. And I do business with those uh, companies because I like the product and it's easy to transfer money into account, it's easy to place an order over the internet, and it's easy to wait for the goods to arrive. And it's not about countries trading with countries, because countries don't trade with countries. It's companies who trade with companies. And this is what the politicians won't tell you. You know, if we can produce a product, or anybody can produce a product, that is acceptable to that customer, surely that is the best way to let it be, rather than unfair tariffs. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the world is our oyster. But if we remain inside the European Union, I'll see our future as a clan. And I also see a real change in the British political system. Because when we withdraw from the European Union, once again, we have people elected to Parliament who will have real power and have the ability to infuse the British public to actually get more engaged with politics because they'll be electing a parliament that has real power and the ability to change legislation that may be bad, generally change it according to a manifesto, rather than just in a few areas what the European Union's tentacles haven't quite yet reached. So ladies and gentlemen, it's about a positive future. It's about a big, wider world. It's not about a shrinking European Union. So I say, please, please use this opportunity to get involved, to think about what can be achieved. And if you agree with me, perhaps you'll think, yeah, maybe he's right when I go out in that referendum and cast that vote to leave the European Union. Thank you.